Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. The, the title of today's message is called Philip the Disciple Maker, meaning Philip, the person who goes and reaches the lost and teaches the lost and helps them become believers. That's why I called it Philip the Disciple Maker instead of that really long sentence. A little easier. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. And the word one is a big word today. It's a theme of our message. God cares about the multitudes and he cares about the one. If you can, say one with me. God cares about you and he cares about the one person in your life that needs him and the many others at the same time. How many are grateful that the Lord found you on whatever road you were walking in one day? And now you're saved, right? Amen. Thank the Lord. Well, today we're going to read about how God used Philip to find the one. You could say that he left the 99 that were already cared for to reach the one. And uh, we're going to read about that in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. This is what it says. And if you recall, there was a great uh, awakening taking place in Samaria. And many people were coming to the Lord. And God calls Philip to leave this amazing movement of salvation in Samaria to go find one man. Beautiful. And this is what it says in verse 26, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and he met the treasure of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Wow, there's a lot going on here in just these four verses. First of all, number one, we see that an angel directed Philip to go meet a man. And he says, go down, uh, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. I want to show you this map because uh, Philip was in Jerusalem at one point and then the persecution happened because of Stephen stoning. So he, he went north to Samaria and you can see Samaria and the arrow going from Jerusalem to Samaria. And then God called him to go back down to the desert road. So he came back down through Jerusalem and then he would go down to the desert road where Gaza is and just so you know, um, at this time, Gaza is to the left, but beforehand in 93 BC, Gaza was over there by the desert road. So it moved in around 50 something BC, Gaza had moved closer to the Mediterranean Sea. But before that, there was what was called the Gaza Desert Road. And so God uh, strategically has an angel tell Philip, go down this desert road and you're gonna meet a man on this road. Okay, so he's heading down towards that Gaza uh, location on the bottom left, but he's taking that desert road to get there. And he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. What, what's a eunuch? Um, the easiest way for me to explain this is a person incapable of procreating in the Bible times maybe by choice, maybe by force, um, maybe by birth. And uh, if it was by force, it was because the king did not want servants in, the, in his palace to be able to procreate or do anything wrong um, with his concubines or his wife. And so to help limit that, he removed that ability. Sometimes they were just by choice and sometimes it was just by birth, incapable of procreating. And we see here that he is the treasurer of Ethiopia, which is today modern day Sudan. Back then it was Ethiopia, today it's Sudan, so Northeast Africa. And he must be pretty wealthy because he is in a chariot or carriage of sort. 
And in this carriage, he's reading a scroll of the book of Isaiah, or at least a portion of it, the prophet Isaiah, a part of our Bible. And that is extremely rare. So he is very wealthy. He's a very important figure in the kingdom there in Ethiopia. He's the treasurer of the queen there. And so he had traveled to Jerusalem to worship God because he was, it looks like, appears to be a Jew uh, from a Gentile nation who converted to Judaism. And he was going there to worship. And just to, just to help you see how passionate he is about his beliefs, he traveled all the way down there, all the way up north to go worship for a week or so and then go back. So he believed in God, the God of the Jews, but he did not yet believe in Jesus Christ. We know the difference now, right? That the Jews believed in God, but they did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. So there was work that needed to be completed. And so God sends Philip and God says, Philip, walk alongside the carriage. Just, just walk alongside the carriage. And when he did, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, which is cool that Philip recognized scripture so well that he could tell he was reading Isaiah, that he was just reading a portion of it and he could hear him saying it. It's just a testimony to us that we should know our word as best as we can. Amen. Okay, so let's go into verse 30. Philip ran over. So the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. So first we have an angel. Now we have the Holy Spirit. Go over and Philip ran over. Did that wake you up a little bit? Because you lost an hour of sleep? Yeah. I couldn't even sleep last night in the beginning. I, I knew they were gonna have to get up earlier. So I kept thinking, oh, so it's really like 10 o'clock right now. I should go to bed now so I can get up. And then I couldn't sleep. And then I woke up before my alarm. So wake up. Okay. So, <laughs> wow, I'm sorry. <laughs> he runs over showing immediate obedience to the Holy Spirit. Almost like this passion and excitement to get to the carriage. And as he runs over, he hears him reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asks this really good question, just simple. Do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, how can I, unless someone instructs me or teaches me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. What a great invitation. And the passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from earth. Who was he talking about there? Oh my goodness, you passed the test. You know the Bible. Praise the Lord. If you were to hear someone, and if, and if you're learning this still, welcome to church, welcome to learning with us. How many Christians here have arrived and you're perfect? Yeah, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you're in good company, okay? We're all learning the word of God. We're all learning these things. And even this, this man who has a scroll of some sort or, or a portion of this scripture did not know exactly. Now, here's the thing. The Jews would have argued a little bit too of who this was. Was this referring to someone else? Was this referring to Isaiah himself? Or was it referring to Jesus? Now, the Christians would obviously point to Jesus because this is prophesied. This scripture we just read is from Isaiah 53, and it was prophesied by Isaiah 700 years before Jesus. And so this is another prophetic word coming into uh, reality or being fulfilled at the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But this scripture in particular is what's called the suffering servant scripture. It's where Jesus suffered for mankind's sins instead of mankind. He took the place for us. That's the good news, isn't it? So God is handing over this Ethiopian eunuch on a silver platter to Philip. But let it be known that Philip did obey and show up when he needed to show up, amen? And that God is gonna serve someone to you or bring someone into your life. And will you have the spiritual awareness and faith and obedience to respond and be the disciple maker in that person's life? I'm praying that God quickens your heart and your spirit to be ready to help. 
And the eunuch asked this question in verse 34. Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? What a great question for Philip. So beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. Now I can picture right now, Philip, knowing the scripture uh, and also being saved himself, being preached to and taught by the apostles who were with Jesus, he is going to go from the Old Testament saying, well, this is the suffering servant who you may know about. Maybe you heard my friend from Ethiopia that a man was crucified in Jerusalem not long ago, but after he died three days, for three days, he was dead or three nights or whatever, however you want to look at that or interpret that, you know, there's arguments on that, right? Because we believe he died on Friday and then he rose again on Sunday. So I've been hearing that being a, a controversial subject. There are many different views on that. But just so you know, the Jews believe that as least, at least if there was 12 hours of that day, you can consider it three days, okay? And that's the view I hold as well. So in other words, Philip, and I'm going off on a tangent there, but I just want you to know, we get caught in the weeds on that a little too much. Did Jesus die and did he rise again? Yes, that's the main thing but I do believe it was on the third day that Jesus rose again and he showed up to the apostles and he showed up to Mary and first to Mary and the women that came to the tomb, then the apostles and then to 500 believers. So I can see that Philip is processing this and maybe even tells his testimony next. So he shares the gospel, the good news that Jesus came to save us from sin and the the wages of sin or the penalty of sin is what? Death. I don't know about you, but I want to be saved from sin and I want to be saved from death. I want to have eternal life. Amen. And so this is really good news. And everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I can see Philip breaking this down to this man on this carriage and he believes. And at some point he must have mentioned water baptism because here's what comes next. Verse uh, 40, I'm sorry, verse 36. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Now, what is water baptism? Water baptism is a physical demonstration of an inward transformation. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, you are washed clean from your old life and all your sin, and you're identified as a new child of God and now a new creation. And what happened was Jesus died, he went down into death, and then he came back out and conquered death, conquered sin and death for us, and now he's alive. Same thing when we are water baptized, we go down into the water as if death has happened of our old life. And now we're a new creation washed clean by the blood of the lamb made new and we come out and now we live a new life in Christ. It's called the shared life of Christ. We share in these things with him. And did you know you also share in his inheritance of everlasting life? So not only do you share in, you know, walking the way he walked and going through what he did. By the way, we don't, it's, it's a beautiful thing if you think about it because he died on the cross so we wouldn't have to. We just, physic, we just physically demonstrate that through water. We don't actually have to die because we have everlasting life. Now, if we were to die before Jesus comes back, the promise is that he raises us to a new life with a new body, especially when he returns back to gather his church. So that's still the promise because Jesus said to Mary and others in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, will live again. Okay? So that's the promise that we have. And I can see Philip breaking this down as well. But he had understood that he needs to be water baptized. Guess what water baptism is? It's one of the first steps of obedience to Christ after you're saved. It's one of the ways you say, I am a believer. I'm identifying with Jesus. I want the whole world to know that I'm a believer in Christ. I have been changed. I have been washed by the blood. I've been washed by the renewing spirit of the Lord. I've been born again 
in the spirit and I come out of that water a brand new person. And let me tell you something, the devil wants you to get back in that water and stay in the water and drown in it. But you should not do that. You should consider yourself alive in Christ. Alive in Christ. A new creation, but also a work in progress too, right? Thank the Lord for his grace to cover us and help us. But as grace has been revealed at this time to teach us to live a godly life. So his grace is there to transform you through, through salvation by faith. Okay, you believe in what Christ has done for you, you are saved. Water baptism is just a physical demonstration of what's already happened to you spiritually. Okay, so you don't have to be water baptized to be saved, okay? But it is a proper step of obedience to the Lord that I am saved. I am, I have shared in your life. I want to be a follower of Christ. So if you have not been water baptized, we highly encourage you to sign up on our events page on our website and get ready for the next water baptism. It's gonna be a powerful time. Verse 39 says, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. I believe that's teleportation. Oh, wait a second, right? Yeah. Wait, right, Pastor Ryan. I don't know, man, that's, that's not logical. Well, people rising from the dead doesn't seem to be logical either. It's a matter of faith. God's a supernatural God. There are people who argue this. Maybe that word just means that he was taken away or that the spirit led him away immediately. He had to go just as quickly as he went to the carriage. He left quickly and went north to Azotus. That might be a theory, but we also see that Elijah was brought up into heaven. We also see that Ezekiel was teleported. So I believe that God can teleport, that God can take. Now, here's the thing. This eunuch may be like, I think an angel just hung out with me because he's gone. Either way, it was a divine experience. And here's why I believe that he was teleported physically. I believe that the eunuch being the only possible believer in Ethiopia or Northern Sudan today, he was gonna need a sign to help him stay encouraged and also preach the gospel that this man told me about this man, Jesus, and then he disappears. Now they may not believe him, but it happened. I believe that this was to strengthen his faith because he was gonna be the only possible believer in Ethiopia at that time. And so God was like, yes, I did show up. Yes, you have believed, you have been water baptized and I'm gonna show you a sign of my power and this man's gonna, whoop, gone. And again, you, you, perhaps you might think that he's like, that was an angel. So be it, but it was Philip, he was a real man, he wasn't an angel but it was beautiful. The angel led him there. The Holy Spirit led him there. And then God takes him immediately to go somewhere else. Why? To preach. So verse 40 says, meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north at the town of Azotus. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. Wow. So Philip just doesn't, he can't stop talking about Jesus. He's on fire. And everywhere he goes, he tells them about what Jesus has done. We don't really hear anything else about Philip's life until later on in the book of Acts where we find out that he settled down somewhere and he has four daughters who are prophets. So he raised a godly family and now they're serving the Lord. Pretty cool. I wanna apply this to our lives today and encourage you with this application. I wanna teach you some disciple making 101. Philip was a disciple maker. I wanna do some disciple making one-on-one. You sound, does that sound good? I wanna equip you and help you make disciples today. Just a brief crash course to help you live like Philip in this moment. And so the key scripture that we have on this command to make disciples and what's also called the great commission, not the great suggestion. It's a command to practice. At some point, we need to learn to start doing this. And not just the church, like leadership, and not just those dedicated volunteers who show up every week. God has called the church to all be disciples of Christ. Just so you know, the word disciples mentioned over 200 times. The word Christians only mentioned three times in the Bible. 
He's called us to be a disciple, a follower. It's also, uh, the word disciple means student or learner and implied student or learner of Jesus, okay? How many wanna be a learner of Jesus and be a student of Jesus and live like Jesus? I know I do. All right, so number one, or the scripture we have for this, our foundation for this is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I will say this again and again, because it needs to get into our hearts and change the way we live. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations. So go make converts or not really not even converts because converts may not do anything after they get saved. Go make disciples. I think that was strategic, but for the sake of helping you understand what disciple means, it's a believer, a follower, a learner of Jesus of all nations, all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So water baptism. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Clear as day, isn't it? And here's the thing, like this still exists today because someone gets saved. And so if you help someone come to Christ, it says that you should help them get baptized, whether the pastor does that, or even if you need to get in the tank with that person or you do it before we have our own. We would like to know that though, by the way, if you do, all right? And there's some instructions on how to do that. But teaching them to obey. So if if you do that, if you lead someone to Christ and you teach them to obey the great commission, which we just read, teaching them to obey everything he has commanded, that means they're gonna have to go out and reach someone. And then that person that they reach is gonna go reach someone. So that continues today. So what happened? Why doesn't the church teach this more? What happened? What we did is we outsourced evangelism and discipleship to the big C or not, well, not Christ, but the church, I should say, the little C, we, we outsource it to the pastor and the people who have the gifting of evangelism, to the people who have the gift of teaching, we outsource it to them and everyone else gets to just kind of chill. That's wrong. That's not biblical. It's not. It's not right. Because it, it, it basically says you don't have responsibility to teach anyone about Jesus and what he said to do. And it's all on Pastor Ryan or whoever's the evangelist, whoever's the teacher. It's all on our big outreaches. I call them the big nets. But guess what? God's called you to carry a fishing pole. We need big nets and we need fishing poles. Like a big net doesn't necessarily mean concentrated care on an individual. In fact, we're all so busy doing the big events and, and, and caring for the stuff to be manned by a volunteer that no one's connecting with anyone. Meanwhile, if we all go out and we don't wait for a Calvary event like Easter at Calvary and we're doing it tomorrow, we're gonna accomplish even more than what one event can do. He has called all of us to go and tell people about what Jesus has done and what he's done in our lives and then teach them even before they believe. Yes, this is why I'm a disciple maker teacher, not an evangelist teacher or discipleship teacher. I'm a disciple maker teacher because Jesus taught disciple making. And Jesus saw this. He saw a church that would, one person would reach and teach at the same time. Let me explain. Philip taught the eunuch what he was reading and then he believed. So he actually discipled and evangelized at the same time. We are to make disciples. We're supposed to teach people what Jesus did and teach them what they're reading in scripture, help them understand it. And then they'll believe. And guess what? Then we have to teach them now that they believed what it means to follow Jesus and what the scriptures say. That was never supposed to be two different arms of the church. It was meant that all of us do that, all of us. And unfortunately, that's been the great disobedience and I would even be as far to say the great sin of the, of the modern day church is that we haven't taken responsibility for the great commission that Jesus called us to do. And it's not healthy, it's not good. 
why are churches declining in America? Why? There's so many churches around this nation. Now I get it. The world is declining in morals and all those things, right? There's many options and all that. We have lost many people from the church in America, okay? It is in a decline. But you know what? Instead of looking at the negative, I'm actually excited because that means there's more people to reach then. That's the silver lining. It's sad reality news right there that people have left the church and then there's more lost people out there, but that just means the opportunity is bigger. And it's an opportunity for the church to repent and start doing what we're supposed to do. Yeah, praise the Lord. I still recall Martin Luther was talking about how his, his monk friend that was praying all the time saw him laboring in the fields. And I might have this backwards. It might be Martin Luther and he was seeing someone else. But the story goes like this, that Martin Luther or someone else was laboring in the fields, trying to bring people to the Lord. But his friend who was more of a, a monastic who would sit around and pray a lot and pray for God to move and do things was praying. And in his prayer, he saw a vision of his friend, Martin Luther, tired in the fields by himself. And while he was praying, he realized I need to be out there with Martin instead of in here praying. Because we, do we need to pray? Oh, oh my goodness, yes. Actually, the Bible says this, ask the Lord of the harvest for the workers. So the first thing he says to do is pray. When he says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few in Matthew 9, he says, ask the Lord for the workers. So the first thing we should be doing is being a praying person. It would change our hearts. But then we're also supposed to be doing a, a doing, we're supposed to be a doing person, a disciple maker who's out there reaching the loss. I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh my goodness. Let me get to my points. I want to uh, tell you about Frank Labak. Anyone here of Frank Labak? Yeah, isn't that wild? We got one guy, yep. Frank was a missionary to Philippines in a predominantly Muslim area, dangerous. And when he got there, he realized that the poverty is directly connected to the illiteracy of reading, the inability of reading. And so he, he had a passion to help people read so that they could get out of their poverty and out of their situation. But what he did is he used scripture and, and other things he wrote to teach people how to read. Well, one by one, people started getting saved. And he said, I just want you to teach someone else now. So each one of you teach one, each one teach one. By the time he was done with his life of work, over a hundred million people learned how to read. And he just happened to use the Bible and all of his little tracts and documents he wrote. And this is his headstone. He is known for each one, teach one. Could you imagine if each one of us in this room just taught one person about Jesus? Just your one. I'm praying that God will lead you to one person, unbeliever slash seeker or a new believer that does not know Jesus enough and needs to grow and needs to learn. And you might be saying, that's me, Ryan. Okay, you're in a great place. You're learning today, amen. But what if each one of us, what if a thousand people in this church helped teach one person and it was successful? And whether they come here or not, it's not the point. I want people to meet Jesus, okay? Yeah. That's God's heart. Look, Philip didn't try to get the eunuch to leave his home and come back to be with him. He, he didn't try to recruit him to his church. Now, if someone doesn't have a church, invite them to church. But the point is, is he left and he was saved. And he, here's the history. Here's what we believe according to early church fathers and historical data that the gospel moved in Ethiopia most likely through this eunuch, even in the leadership of that country. Because God was still fulfilling his scripture in Acts 1.8 but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that would have been considered possibly more to the ends of the earth at that time. It was spreading out. It was Rome and all that was further up as well. So God was fulfilling his word that it wasn't just for the Jews, but the Gentiles, anyone who's not a Jew could be saved and people were getting saved. 
What if each one of us taught someone? And here's the thing, you may not know this, but that one that you reach will end up teaching one if you model this for them. That's the power of, of discipleship and multiplication or disciple making and multiplication. And so I'm assuming that you call yourself a disciple of Jesus today and that you wanna be a disciple maker. So I'm gonna give you four quick tips to help you be a disciple maker. Number one, and these are disciple maker principles to live by, okay? Number one, a disciple maker must be a disciple and follower, uh, follower of Jesus. Wow, Ryan, that, thanks. Thanks, buddy. That was, uh, I really needed to hear that. That was pretty, pretty simple. Yes, but it's true. You can't lead someone where you haven't been first. If you don't follow Jesus, you may lead someone down the wrong path. We're not trying to make disciples of us. We're trying to make disciples of Christ. A disciple maker must be a disciple and follower of Jesus. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said, come follow me. Not just the church. He didn't say, come follow, come follow the church. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. When we follow Jesus, he would transform you into a disciple of Christ. John 8, 31 said, Jesus said to the people who, lived, who believed in him, whoever believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? It's a really important question to ask today. If we're gonna make disciples, we must first decide to be a disciple of Jesus ourselves. And he's gonna transform you and he's gonna help you be the person you need to be to make disciples. Because you probably already count yourself out. I can't do that, Ryan. Maybe not yet then. Follow Jesus, follow him. He will make you or transform you into a fisher of people. He will help you become who you need to become. Number two, a disciple maker comes alongside to carefully teach and guide their one. This one could be an unbeliever or a believer, and you are called to open your life, not just the scriptures with this person. You ready for this? It's the word available. A disciple maker is available. Their life is open to the person that they're ministering to. In Mark 3, 13 through 14, Jesus said, come and be with me. He called them to be with him. When you disciple make someone, you call them to be with you, to hang out with you, to do life with you, not just open the Bible, but open your life. And I know that's scary. I know that can be awkward. I know all that. But the Lord will lead you to someone and, it, and he'll help you do that. He will help you have the, the grace and the strength and the love to spend time with that person. It may be someone at work. It may be someone in your neighborhood. It may be someone you know from the community, but he will open those doors. It may be a family member. First Thessalonians 2.8, Paul said this. He said this to the church. We loved you so much that we share with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. See, Paul opened up his life, not just the Bible. 1 Timothy 4, 16, as you're doing this, we need to be careful, right? What we teach and how we guide. Well, Paul told Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Be careful what you say and what you teach. You know what the safest bet is? The Bible. And let the Bible speak the Bible. Let it speak for itself. Thirdly, a disciple maker strives to be an example of Christ to everyone. We should be an example of what it means to be a godly person around those we're leading. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Yeah, so here's the thing though. It doesn't mean we're gonna execute that perfectly. In fact, and I'm not saying you, you use your imperfections as your starting point with people all the time, but if you act like you always have it together, then you're not approachable either, okay? We need to be real. We need to be authentic. We don't want to be fake. Okay, we don't want to act like we always do it right. We don't. We also shouldn't always do it wrong either. <laughs> hey, I have another lesson for my wrong mistake again, you know. We need to have our victories, amen? <laughs> we need to have our victories, okay? 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And 1 John 2.6 says, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. 
If you're gonna be a disciple maker, make sure your life is consistent with your testimony, with your teaching, with your disciple making. Make sure your life is consistent with who you say you represent, amen? And lastly, a disciple maker will eventually encourage their one to go reach one and teach one. Eventually, your one person should also go reach one and teach one. Second Timothy 2.2 2 says, you have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. That's four generations. Paul, Timothy, trustworthy people, and then to others. Four people, it's called multiplication. Disciple making is meant to be multiplying, a multiplying culture. Each one, teach one. And you may not even realize this, but someone you teach may reach even more people than just one. And then after a year or two years, now we're reaching multitudes of people. It's, it's the math of multiplication. It's not addition, it's multiplication. It's three times three instead of three plus three. Pretty cool. So you have a Bible today. I want to help you be a disciple maker. All right. Hold your Bibles up just so I can see everyone got one. And if you didn't get one yet, please grab one before you go. And let me, let me say this first. If you need a Bible, cause you're here and you're like, wait, I'm one of the people you're talking about. I'm like, I'm like the Ethiopian guy who, who doesn't know the scriptures and needs help understanding them. You can have it, it's yours. But I want you to do something before you leave. I want you to grab one more because I want you to go apply this message today. Because here's the thing, like this Ethiopian eunuch was reading a portion of the Bible from the Old Testament and it turns into salvation of his life. Can you imagine if people have the entire Bible, what could happen? and what God can do with the entire Bible. So this is your gift. And I'm asking that you would pray on who to give this to. And I'm asking you to take this card and read it over so you're familiar with it and might help you as well, okay? And I'm asking you to take these references, key scripture references for seekers or new believers. And I would like for you to highlight them so that when they open the Bible, they're already highlighted and their eyes go to those scriptures. Now, it may be that you underline them with a pen, just be really neat and nice as much as possible, okay? Don't do it in the car on your way to home. <laughs> but now, listen, I could have put this, this would be covered with verses. I just chose these by, as the Lord led me. But if God gives you scriptures to highlight, do that. I forgot to say this in the first service, so I'm in trouble. But in this service, I want to say this. Um, if you want to write a note to this person. Now, here, here's what I recommend. I recommend someone that you know or see on a regular basis. So that you can have this interaction with them and go, hey, how you doing? You know, have you opened up the Bible? How's it going? Do you have any questions? Or they'll come to you. But just like this this Ethiopian man, we may never see that person again. So if the, Lord, if the Lord tells you to give it to a stranger that you may never see again, do it, okay? And inside is a postcard to our church. And there's, a, there's an email on here if anyone needs to get a hold of us. We put in here digital Bibles are also available. So we highly recommend these two Bible apps. We gave pretty much a help for someone who's intimidated by this Bible to know how to read it, okay? This is an easy translation to read as well. And I'm just asking that you would pray over who to give this to, but you would also make yourself available and ready to communicate with that person, amen? And I'm gonna ask you to do something kind of risky if you're comfortable with it, okay? If, especially if you know the person, maybe consider putting your email in there or some kind of contact info of some sort, not your home address, okay? But just consider that. I'm gonna say one more thing too, because I, I should have said this earlier. I'm gonna say it again. Yeah, don't, don't use this as some kind of pickup tool, you know, because you, you had your eyes on, you had your eyes on some lady and ladies, you saw that dude at work. You're like, hey, here's my number, you know. I just had to say it, okay? Just had to say it. I know there's some desperate times right now. Sometimes desperate measures, okay? 
Like, oh. oh man, oh goodness, woo! But can you imagine? Like, okay, wow, that's funny. There's other ways, okay? There's other ways instead of using Jesus in that moment, all right? So what I recommend is, is ladies find a lady, gentlemen find find a gentleman, right? Okay, that's safe. That's safe. All right. Uh, that's a big smile right there. I guess, uh, you know, because I just, it's funny. I want to laugh really hard right now. The Lord, Lord leads you. And would you be a disciple maker today? Would you begin to be and view yourself as a disciple that will be available to help someone understand? Now, you know what this means. Go back to step one. I need to be a disciple of Jesus Christ myself. That means a learner. I highly recommend you're reading your Bible. And I highly recommend that you're praying. Praying for these opportunities, praying for the people, for God to give you the words to say and the wisdom and the knowledge to understand and to help. And let me just give you another tip as a disciple maker. When you don't know, you don't know, and you just tell them that. That's a really good question. Let me get back to you on that. Okay? and do some research. Or if you need help, I can try to help. Or one of our pastors or other trusted disciple makers in your life could help you, okay? So let's stand together and we're just gonna pray over these because just so you know, you know, God gave me this idea in 2019 and then COVID hit. And we went, we all got away from each other and we're in each other's homes, you know, hiding in our homes or something like that, or you know, trying to stay safe and church was online and God, I don't know why, but a month ago when I was preparing for this sermon, God said, do that. So we went out and bought a thousand Bibles. Thank you for your giving because it costs over $3,000 for these Bibles. <clears throat> and guess what? We're gonna do it again if we have to. Amen. Keep us stocked up. Yep. So if, you, if you've been given to Calvary, you just helped us do an outreach together as a whole church. And just, just think about this dream. A thousand people will have Bibles in our community, hopefully in the next week or so. That's awesome. So let's pray that the Holy Spirit makes these words jump right off into their hearts because the Bible is alive. The Bible is alive. And be ready to be like Philip because people are gonna have questions, all right? But I believe God can use you. So let's just begin to pray. God, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for finding us on the road we were walking on. And today, God, if there's someone that is sensing your love and seeing their need and conviction for salvation today, I pray, God, you would save them right now, whether they're watching online or whether they're in this room, that, God, they would put their faith in you, that they would repent of their sin. They would, they would acknowledge that they're a sinner that needs to turn away from sin and that they would believe in Jesus Christ as the only answer for sin and as the only way to eternal life. I pray, God, they would say just a simple prayer to you, acknowledging that today. And Lord, that they'd be ready to follow you, which won't be easy. It would be difficult. But God, you will be with us to help us. And we as a church will be alongside them. And I pray, God, that, that you would change them from this day forward. And Lord, I pray for those who are gonna receive these Bibles. Lord, put people's um, faces on our, on our hearts right now, on our minds people that we've been caring for and, and haven't known how to start a conversation, well, now we have a starter. We're gonna give them a gift and it's the Bible. We're gonna give them this card, an invitation to our Easter weekend. And, and we're gonna give them this card to help them understand the Bible. God, pray that Lord, you would lead us and guide us, whether it's a stranger or someone we see all the time. God, I pray that we would be a disciple maker who follows you, who will carefully come alongside, who will be an example and who will teach Help us to be available, Lord, too. God, use this outreach, something we've never done before, Lord. Use it, Lord, to reach so many people, as many as you want, Lord God. And Lord, may also challenge us to see ourselves as that we need to be ready and that we are called to be disciples who make disciples. So empower us with your Holy Spirit, lead and guide us by your Spirit. We thank you, God for the salvation of those who will have this Bible. 
Lord, we pray for the salvation. We pray for a greater understanding. We pray for open hearts, receptive hearts, God. I pray, Lord, that even if, if someone doesn't receive it well, Lord, that they will take it home and Lord, you will melt their heart of stone or their cold heart, Lord, and they would open themselves to you, Lord. Go before us, God, and lead us. We thank you, God, again, for what you've done in our lives. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer today, our prayer team will be here. Maybe you need encouragement. Maybe you need prayer for things in your life. We're ready to pray with you. God bless you. Have a great, great day.